Good evening, everybody. And I really do mean good evening in this situation right now. It's 1045 of the East Coast. I'm Stephen Rabinowitz. That um, guy to the left of me, who we all listen to, is Joe Tafaro from many different projects, including Last Word on Sports. And the other two can introduce themselves right now. I'm Jay Kaplan. I'm Anthony Schley. Let's go! Stay up. <laughs> It's our 2021 NFL preview show. So kick off to the 2021-2022 season with fans back in the stands at full capacity. It's only 68 to 69 hours away. Nice. We'll talk about everything for the season of the NFL that will end one day before Valentine's Day. The NFL's way of controlling the world is getting right to us now. At the land of the city of angels, Los Angeles, California, and their stadium that is massively expensive and looks beautiful. Jerry Jones is now thinking of upgrading his stadium another $500 million because of it. But before we get to the dreams of a new season, let's get hit with a dose of reality. While the NFL is reportedly at a 93% vaccination rates, and give credit, that's the highest of the four major sports. NBA is reportedly in 90, and MLB and NHL are currently at 85. COVID problems persist throughout camps. From Carson Wentz, who may or may not be vaccinated, to <laughs> Lamar Jackson, who is definitely not vaccinated, to Titans coach Mike Vrabel, to Zach Martin of the Cowboys, the first player this year to miss a game because of COVID in the regular season. COVID has taken the players out for a week at a time and will be doing so in the upcoming seasons from training camps and regular NFL season, regular season play. Let's talk, gents. Should the NFL adopt the Dax and don't play policy? Uh, I'll leave the floor out to anybody who wants to go. Let's start with Jack. Well, you know, here, get ready, guys, because I've been holding this rant in for a while. Um, but we, we, we know that the only reason the NFL has not been able to mandate this is because the Players Association has to defend players like Bill's wide receiver, Cole Beasley, as much as they have to defend those players who were first in line to get the vaccine. The NFL has told teams they cannot cut players strictly based on vaccine status, officially anyway. Teams won't leave themselves open for a potential lawsuit by coming out and saying that's why they're cutting a player. But the reality is, guys, the vaccination status is something teams will be taking into account and did take into account. I have no doubt when they were looking to cut players now and, you know, further down the line from like the middle of the bottom of their roster. Teams are going to want to keep players who have the best chance of being available and unvaccinated players are subject to mandatory quarantines if they're determined to be a high risk close contact to someone who is infected and unvaccinated players have to isolate for 10 days when they test positive. Vaccinated players aren't required to quarantine after exposure, and those who test positive can return to work after posting just two negative tests 24 hours apart, provided they're asymptomatic. I mean, with the NFL letting teams know that in no uncertain terms, there's not going to be any rescheduling of games due to COVID, forfeiting games that there aren't enough players overall or in a particular position group, like, I don't know, quarterback, um, and having the expense of your opponent is the is a thing this season. I can't see many teams letting what happened to the Buffalo Bills this summer. You know, a member of the training staff gets t- tests positive, causes a domino effect. Five players get sent home, four get sent to the COVID list. I mean, imagine that happening during the regular season. The protocols that the NFL and the PA agreed upon for this season heavily incentivize people to get vaccinated. I mean, think about it. what the Bills dealt with could give an opponent a major competitive advantage. Salute me, Rabbi if it happened during the regular season. And yet there are still players like Beasley who have been very outspoken against the vaccine, saying it's about personal choice and because he believes that relevant information is being kept from the players about the vaccine. Yeah, he's one of those guys. And he's just one of the Bills players who was sent home. I mean, think about Cam Newton, guys. Same situation with the Patriots, and now he's gone. Yeah, rookie of the, you know, rookie first round pick, Mac Jones out, played him and won the starting quarterback job. But if you think Cam misunderstanding the Patriots' COVID protocols and not being vaccinated on top of it had zero to do with Bill Belichick cutting the former MVP, then you are kidding yourself. I mean, Bill's, yeah, I know. And Bill's GM, Brent. did. Calm down here. I, it, 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 it was more of a pure coincidence, but yeah, okay. it did. Okay. 
Bill's, Bill's GM, Brandon Bean, obviously couldn't be happy about what happened to his team. And I'm sure that Belichick was not happy about Newton's unvaccinated status negatively impacting his availability when a decision on who would be the Pats QB1 hung in the balance. The Vikings had issues. The Titans had issues. The Colts are one of the lowest vaccinated teams in the league, and it starts with Carson Wentz, who will not get vaccinated. All that plus all the other names that the rabbi just threw out. I mean, here's the thing, guys. You know, Rabbi put it out there. 93% of the players, 99% of the coaches and staff are vaccinated by, you know, by, by the standard that they're going by, which is, you know, a previous confirmed case of COVID and at least one dose of the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine. Uh, but you know what? And you still have, but you still, you're running into a situation where mask mandates are still on the table. 68 confirmed positive cases during training camp with the unvaccinated getting COVID at seven times the rate of those who are vaccinated. Yet with the league, when the league proposed a mandate, the NFL PPA opposed it, according to NFL Deputy General Counsel Larry Fez, uh, Ferrazani. He also said on a conference call that the PA had pushed back Push to go back to daily COVID-19 testing for all players while the league's proposed testing vaccinated players once a week. Currently, vaccinated players are tested every two weeks, unvaccinated daily. Look, guys, with no vaccination mandate in place, I'm going to be watching to see if more unvaccinated players that, you know, of the stature of a Beasley or a Newton get cut, released either before or during the season because they're intransigent with regards to getting the vaccine causes an outbreak and cost their team a game. It just makes me why the NFLPA just wouldn't put the vaccine mandate to a vote of the membership. Let them decide themselves. Yeah, I'll go next. I'll go next. Um, and speaking of the Buffalo Bills, uh, Isaiah McKenzie, remember, uh, remember him? He got fined $14,000 because apparently he wasn't wearing his mask inside of the team facility. Soon after that, he went and got his post uh, vaccination shot. So obviously hitting the players' pockets, if it encourages them to uh, go get vaccinated, then so be it. And one of the teams that I'm going to talk about later on is among the teams with the lowest vaccination rate. That was the Minnesota Vikings. And like I said, I'll get into that team later on in the show. Look, we all know that um, the vet that the, uh, the lack of vaccinations or whatnot was going to play a part somehow, some way in players making the team. Even if Urban Meyer coming out in a oops formal matter of saying it publicly, we all know that uh, vaccination status was going to be taken into consideration because look, even when Jerry Jones is on board with uh, with, uh, vac- with players getting vaccinated, it's because of money. That's pretty obvious. I mean, Jerry Jones, he doesn't want any of his players uh costing his team a possible game and obviously with an odd number of games because of the extra week 17 you know a forfeited game could cost your playoff spot for all you know and and the nfc east what well, every day so. the money oh yeah yeah i mean a cost of games and maybe a cost of revenue now because fans are back in the stands and you got to look out like this i mean the the the, the players and you and also we've seen with cam newton and we saw with Lamar Jackson, and we've seen a few other times during the preseason, and we saw all of last season. Can you really trust the players to just behave themselves away from the team facility? Obviously, not so much. And look, there, I think we all know why. The, we all know the, the, the league couldn't mandate this league wide because obviously the players association uh, pushed back against it. But I think it. it I think they're, they're trying to encourage players to get vaccinated because they, the league is not trying to reschedule games on a Tuesday afternoon or not happening this year. Or Wednesday afternoon. It's not happening. And and, and here's another thing, too, it was like for the cold beasts in the world, what's going to happen if a team outbreak happens before for the game? The the league, I mean, like, never mind your team, the fan base may be, may be a little pissed off more than anything. And we all know that – um that that uh, Robo's fans on social media could be a nightmare thing to deal with, especially if you cost a team uh, a forfeit. So look, I would love to have seen players actually just uh, doing the right thing. And obviously 93% is a very high rate, especially among the four major sports. But of course you still got the Stranglers and you have to, you have some players on, particularly on the Washington football team during the summer coming out and saying how they need more research and, they need more, and and they, they, they're not sure because it wasn't FDA approved. Okay, well, now it's FDA approved, and, I, and, and it kills me with the whole do my own, need some more research thing when it's like you play, you play a game where 
every down you're risking CTE. So I don't understand that part, but that's another that's a another thing. But um, yeah, I, like I said, like you have coaches like Ron Rivera who have compromised immune systems. You have front office um front office personnel like Dave Getterman as well. That's among that group. So like you, you you're trying you 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 you, you want to encourage and you're trusting the players to at least do the right thing if they're not going to get vaccinated at least take the necessary precautions to not get sick not cause an outbreak but um like I said trust yeah them. by the way and let me let me yeah let me uh, add up to that by the way I, the one team that actually uh, improved their vaccination rate after the negative coverage was Washington. They went from 60% and now they're up to 84%. So I think the negative the negative impact to the media when you're saying, especially with someone like Ron Rivera, who is a leader amongst men. I know some people don't like to hear that phrase, but when he it's says a, go get the vaccine, applicable. when he says go get the vaccine, this team has gotten and gotten, gotten the vaccine. So uh, Joe, if you have anything to bring to this, please bring it to the table because it's such an uncomfortable topic and I want to finish it off when I'm <laughs> Yeah, no, everybody's correct. I mean, if to, to say that guys aren't, to say that guys' jobs aren't tied to whether they make the decision to get it or not is crazy. Again, that's what you have to say in public, but we all know the same thing. If Cam Newton got sick, whether he's starter or not, and infects half the team, and they lose two games, does anybody want them on the team? And it, and that's the whole point of this is that it has nothing to do with you agreeing or disagreeing with their personal decision. You're saying, as they've said about anything other than a pandemic is, if you can't trust the guys you play with to take care of themselves, that take care of you, because now you're costing these guys money, you're costing these guys wins, you're costing these guys playoff positions. You can't have anybody, you can't have one guy on the team putting 53 guys at risk. And that's how it is with anything, whether it's a pandemic or anything else. That's how the NFL is run. And so it'll always be run. Yes, yeah, it's a deadline at this point. I do think one thing that uh, does hurt in this situation is there's no vaccine mandate outside of the healthcare community, outside of the medical community, in any of um, in any walk of life, really, in the United States. I think the NFL, though... Well, wait a second, Rabbi. You got to remember... Well, no. What profession outside of the medical profession hey, has a vaccine just, or you're fired? Oh, not or you're fired. My profession. That's essentially <laughs> not what we're not saying. Or okay, if you're going to call it or you're fired, that, that's Which one... Which is what we're kind of talking about okay. right now. Okay. Yes. Okay, yeah, right. that's kind it, of the reason why. I just want to make sure that we're, we're you know. We're, no, that's we're, what we're talking we're, about. We're, vaccine, and which was the initial question. Vaccine, are you are you out of here? And maybe, I feel like the NFL might be the first or the for, first league to do that, especially if there are cases that bring some major players out of games, even if it's just for one game at a time. All right, let's move on to sports. Let's talk about the co-tenants of MetLife Stadium, starting with the Giants. It's a very unpredictable division. And by unpredictable division, I mean shit division in most years. <laughs> and the Giants have remained somewhat healthy through training camp and are ready for Teddy and the Bronx on Sunday afternoon at 4.15. All right, let's talk some G-Men boys. Jay, first question to Joseph Farrow, please. <laughs> Well, Joseph, I mean, we're, uh, we talked about Daniel Jones extensively in our training camp show back on July 22nd. So I'm not going to go reiterate all of the things we already know and discussed and the areas we were looking to see him improve upon coming into his third Giants training camp. Struggled the two preseason games he played. Some of that was due to being constantly under pressure due to weak pass protection and not having his full complement of playmakers around him. Last week was the first time all summer that he had – he lined up under center with all of his guys alongside him. Barkley, who'd been dealing with a knee. Kenny Galladay, dealing with a hamstring. Kadarius Toney, dealing with a hamstring. And tight end Kyle Rudolph, dealing with a foot. They finally lined up alongside Sterling Shepard and Darius Slayton after a prolonged absence due to injury. Granted, tight end Evan Ingram sat out practice last week after injuring his calf in the preseason finale. But with so many pieces in and out of the lineup during camp and the ongoing issue with the offensive line, Jones was pressured on 43% of his dropbacks in the final preseason game. It's difficult, I think, to have a handle on how the offense is going to look. And with all that being said, 
Has what you saw in camp and the preseason made you optimistic or pessimistic that Jones will take the leap that we talked about that he needs to take in his third season in the NFL? Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm still in the same spot I was as far as I think he's ready to do it. I think he's, it's nice that he's been in the system again. Again, we only watch, we only get to see certain parts of practices. They had those practices with Cleveland and New England that kind of took the place of those preseason games. So, so they didn't play in those games, and which was good because, again, you know, some coaches want to show things. Some coaches don't want to show certain things. Um, it gave all those other guys a chance to rest, but to be able to be out on the field and be in meetings and practice and do certain things. From the things you did see, and again, all you ever see on social media from training camp is what people want to show you. Mm-hmm. If, they, if you wanted to pick out the three drop balls and say, oh, they had an awful day at, you know, at camp today, that's what they're going to show you. Or if, they, or if you look out of the Giants app, nobody ever drops a ball. So <laughs> they're world beaters. So, so, so social media is whatever anybody wants to do. And I think that this narrative that's coming out, again, we saw a half of a football game after three days of practice against the same team. And we decided that Andrew Thomas is garbage and he never should have been drafted into the NFL. Mm-hmm. We decided that they're going to struggle for the rest of the year. And who it is, is these guys, these young sports writers, and, and I've said this to you guys before, and I'm not trying to be the old man of the group, but these young guys that, that want to prove Dave Gettleman wrong, that he says you win with defense and you win with running the ball and they go, No, you have to have Pat Mahomes and you have to throw it 80 yards and I reply. Well, again, they didn't win the Super Bowl this year. I think the team who played defense and we had this conversation before the game that the team that actually played defense was able to clamp down on that offense of Kansas City and put Mahomes in a bad spot. He got hurt and who lost the game? It's Kansas City Chiefs. So unfortunately, what I don't like is this narrative going around that they're going to struggle so much because you saw them play 15 plays and you decided nobody knows what they're playing. We all know Joe judge is going to move guys around. That's what he did last year. Okay. We don't know where anybody's going to play on this line. They brought in a couple of veteran guys to, to plug in. They, they have a couple of guys, you know, Shane Lemieux is probably the scariest one because we don't know if he's hurt or not. Supposedly he might have a tour in meniscus. Again, someone put that out there. I didn't hear a doctor say it. I didn't hear the team say it. Right. All of a sudden, it's after he might have a torn meniscus. Well, that means somebody made it up. That means either Adam Schefter or one of these clowns decided he didn't look right and he was limping, so he must be hurt. We'll find out on Sunday. You know, they're going to go up against Von Miller, who's aging a little bit, but he's still good. You're going to go up against Bradley Chubb, who's very good. And we're going to see what kind of scheme they come up with. Um you know, as far as the offense goes and having all these new weapons, what did I say to you in the in our preseason special was I wouldn't expect a lot from Kadarius Tony. I think he's going to continue to get, get injured, and I think he's going to continue to, to have to work to get into the offense. And But I think having Kyle Rudolph and having Galladay back and having Saquon Barkley back, now this awful scheduling by the NFL having to have a Thursday night game week one, um, and the red and the Washington football team gets two home games in a row. Uh, doesn't really play too well to me, but what are you going to do? So now the question is, do you play Saquon on Thursday and have that be his first game and not have him play again on Sunday? Or do you it's, have to now say he can only carry the ball 20 times or 25 times? I can see him being on a pitch Number count. Two. Why they brought Booker. Yeah, it has to be. I think one thing that I have to say, though, is – that's a good backfield. That's one area that they've upgraded to. And I think they realize that Saquon's going to have to be on a pitch count. So, but Saquon on a pitch count does, but Saquon on a pitch count doesn't mean he can't take three of those for touchdowns. So. Oh, no. That's what they're <laughs> expecting. Just yeah. remember that game against the Jaguars uh, and, and two years the ago. The stat that was out there last week was Jones is the Giants average. 31 points a game when he's in the game and they average 23 points a game when he's not in the game. So you're getting back a, a real piece. You're not getting back somebody that they say, Oh, you know, he could help them get other guys open. Well, that's not his point. Oh, he's just a guy you have to game plan for. Yeah. And, and exactly. And that's where this is going to go. So getting back to your original question, Jay, 
I think Daniel having all of this extra weaponry, having the comfortability of being where he is, having the offensive line know that, you know, they know they struggled for the 10 plays they played, 15 plays they played. We'll see what happens. We'll see who's going to play. We'll see who's going to be on the field. Judge says it all the time. If you practice well, you play, you're going to play. And so we'll see who the starting, we don't even know the starting five are going to be until we get in our seats on Sunday, um, which I'm extremely excited to go back to the stadium and um, sit in my stand by my seats. I never sit in my seats. I stand because there's nobody <laughs> behind me. So I don't have to worry about anybody telling me to sit down. Uh, but I think it'll be exciting to see what they can do as far as getting the ball out quickly throwing some of those slants. Jay, you've said about using motion. They used a lot of motion in the preseason, mm-hmm. a lot of pre-snap stuff. They did ask, it was funny, they actually asked Jason Garrett that question about using motion. And he said, last year we decided to go tempo instead of having mm-hmm. a lot of guys move and just get up to the ball and go. And that was their, that was their way of protecting some of the guys last year was let's just go tempo so that the defense can't get set or move guys around. Um, this year, if you've noticed it, it's all pre staff stuff. It's not, it's not, um, it's not door. Nobody actually in motion at the snap, but a lot of guys switching sides and moving around to different things. So we'll see how that takes. And, you know, we'll see who's on this team in a month. You know, they, they had to go out and find some offensive linemen. I think Gettleman was right. He thought more of them would be available after the first part of the preseason, the first and second game, instead of everybody being available only after the third, um, which makes it tough to bring new guys in. But we'll see how we rebuilt it. We'll see where they go from there. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mark you down as cautiously optimistic, yeah. Joseph. Yeah. <laughs> Again, we, you, know, right. we, you know, we talked last night about how we all picked Russell Wilson as the MVP after four weeks last year. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say the same thing Joe Judge said this year. September isn't our season. You know, that's not – if we go 0-3, that doesn't mean we're done. That doesn't mean that this – he said if we ever looked back and said, yeah, this this is perfect the way we're doing it, then we're not doing our jobs. No. So, but if, you know, we'll see what they turn but into. But to be fair, if he has – if they go 0-3 with Denver, Washington, and Atlanta in those first three, I'm kind of ringing some well, sort of an alarm. It's, I think, it's, I think it's, a way to get, it's a good gateway. Yeah, but I think it's it's the way it happens. We've always said that. You know, of if course. it's if it's a freak thing, if the offensive line plays great and something happens where people get hurt, you know, you're you're gonna see for injuries, you're gonna see a lot of different things. I do think what helps is what you and I have talked about, Rabbi, is they may be only playing up against 17 points or something. So but we'll you know that's, we'll get into that later. that's the huge you know. thing. All right, Anthony. Yeah, I was at that uh, giants Patriots pieces game a few weeks ago, and the first thing I pointed out to Rabbi was Andrew Thomas. Uh, didn't look too good that night. He got beat a couple for a couple of sacks. Uh, the second one, I won't put too much on him because Daniel Jones kind of held the ball too long. But it, it seems like Groundhog Day. Every season, the last few, like five or six years, we have to talk about the, the question marks surrounding this offensive line. So I will ask as a fan, how concerned should Giant fans be about this offensive line going into the new season? Again, I, I you know, again, if, if you if you read through some of the comments, and again, you know, you can make anything sound as bad as you want. You can make anything sound as good as you want from watching film, from doing different things. Joe Judge said today, because somebody asked him the same exact type of question, Anthony, about Andrew Thomas and about how he had a bad game. And do you think this and do you think that? And he said, you know, you guys, basically what he said was, you guys don't know what the play was called. You don't know what the protection was called. It may not have been him. We've seen that before where he's supposed to take the inside guy and the back's supposed to chip or the tight end's supposed to chip, and they don't. And everybody goes, oh, he got beaten around the outside. He's terrible. He's got no speed. He's got no feet. And you go, well, it wasn't him that was supposed to do that. He did. He might have done his job on that play. We also don't know where they're going to play Solder. We're not sure where they're going to play Thomas. They may switch those guys around a couple of times. You know, this whole thing happened because Nate Solder sat out last season, which was his right, and he should have done it. When you hear his story, he he made the right decision. But they drafted a right tackle who was going to play right tackle until Nate Solder retired, which would have given him two years to learn the craft. 
Instead, he had to go up against everybody he could play last year and went up against some big guys starting with Bud Dupree and Chase Young and all those guys all year long to learn. So for him to get beat twice in the first half of a game, I'm, I'm not that concerned about that. If it happens every play from the same position, yeah, you start to say, hey, maybe this guy isn't that good. The fact that Will Hernandez is back and is healthy and is playing well, the fact that they've got a couple of different um, guys inside where they, they can, if they want to move Gates over, they have another center. They've built this depth up again where they can rotate these guys in and, and handle whatever happens. So I'm not, I'm not that worried about just that position because it's still a team game. I know fantasy football has turned this into an individual sport. <laughs> but it's not baseball, it's football. There's 11 guys, at least nine of the 11 guys have to do their job on every play for the play to be successful. You know, we see the cornerback and the wide receiver stand together on the outside on a running play and play, play a little touchy with each other. So I'm not going to say it's 11 guys that have to do their job, but at least nine of those guys have to mesh together. Quarterback, running back, who has to – pass protect and then go and then decide when to go out. You got guards and tackles that have to watch for twists. You've got all these guys that have to do their jobs, tight ends, releasing same thing and running the proper routes and then getting themselves open. I don't blame it on one spot. I don't blame it on one person for sure. Um, I can't imagine that he's going to get beat seven straight times, you know, every quarter and they're just going to leave him in there and not make any changes. And, and he, that he's that bad. I mean, he did play a pretty good program in Georgia. And I'm not going to argue whether, and again, the argument of whether he should have been picked fourth or he should have been the other pick, yeah. who cares? And we'll, we'll know that in three years, like we always say. You, you don't know guys until you know who they are. Yep. Um, so I, I think that I'm not as worried about it until I see them in a game setting with a game specific game plan for a specific opponent. When they played the Patriots, and I can't believe you didn't ask me for my tickets because I would have given them to you. <laughs> I, 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 they did not game plan for the Patriots. They just put guys out there and ran vanilla plays. They didn't have their running back. They didn't have wide receivers. They didn't have tight end. They didn't have – half the team didn't even play. So why anybody would even look at that game, you know, that's why I sold those tickets for 50 bucks. Because it's John, no longer that, the preseason. It's no longer this three quarters. Let's go out and run our offense for three quarters. Uh, you know, I, I, the only thing that ever bothers me, I think I'll tell you the truth, is we have never had, even back through the 80s, we have never had a preseason where you sat there and go, wow, these guys scored 24 points in every game and they look fantastic. You'll <laughs> you see Green Bay go out and do it. You see Pittsburgh go out and do it in years past. You've seen – you see a lot of teams that just walk out. The 49ers used to do it all the time, right? You throw Joe Montana and those guys out there, they got out, score a touchdown. All right, go sit down, fellas. You look great. We've never really looked that way. Even with Phil Sims, with Eli Manning, with any of those guys, we've never looked that way. So that always bothers me because they seem to get off to a slow start. And again, this melding, you know, getting the team to – kind of mold into what they're going to be by week five or six. Um, I'd love one year to just start out by dominating everybody, but I'm not expecting that, but I'm also not expecting the disaster that it sounds like everybody else is expecting. Well, I mean, Joe, this is something that we've talked about is that, you know, the preseason, everybody likes to extrapolate by what they see or don't see in the preseason. And the younger the generation of, you know, guys these wannabe you know reporters get is that they're missing they don't get that because even when there was four preseason games the dress rehearsal was the third preseason game the ones on both sides of the ball played maybe the first half but you still didn't trot out you didn't open up your entire playbook yeah. it was you you ran some basic stuff or you know a couple of things here or there that you want to work on just so these guys can get reps in a game situation, it didn't mean anything. And that's the thing. You could never extrapolate by what goes on in the preseason games because for the most part, now more than ever, starters don't play. And whoever is out there, they're running basic stuff. They're not – you're not – what you're seeing those guys run is not well, what's really going to get run. 
So you listed all the guys that didn't play in that game because they've all been hurt because they didn't even get there to practice. And then somebody says, oh, your average throw the other night was 6.1 yards. Is that because he can't throw? Because he doesn't No, have it's big. <laughs> you know, well, okay. you don't even know who oh. anybody he probably had name tags for some of the guys on yeah. the field. Because <laughs> Hold on, though. <laughs> and I think we've talked about this, and I want to get to my question right after this. Um, what are we supposed to do? Are we just supposed to say every team is going to go 16-0? and 0, Or no. in this case, 17-0? No. No. no, I understand that. But we can't basically say, oh, we understand exactly that this is not what's going to happen. Hell, Week one, you're not going to see the best teams because they haven't played. But unfortunately, if you live in an era, in an era where there is social media around and football is king, whenever you see a little bit of a product out there, those are the results that are going no, to get I, reported. I agree with you. And I think it's, you know, it's almost like you have to limit what, you, you know, I, as you guys know, I do, I limit who I read and who I listen to and what I follow. Yeah. It's ridiculous when there's a press conference going on or even watching a Mets game, Anthony, you look on Twitter and seven people in a row have to tell me that somebody just took a third strike. I'm like, do you think nobody's, if you're following the giants, are you not following the five NFL writers and the five guys that cover the giants on Twitter? And they all say the same thing. Oh, that was the guy dropped the ball. Oh, it was third down. Oh, was, he made the first. I'm like, why don't you come up with a backstory? Why don't you come up with something that's a little bit more interesting than just what's going on in this instant at this time? But I don't see anybody who does. And the only guy who tries exactly. sometimes is Art Stapleton tries to put out these big stories, but he's usually wrong on his premise and, and what but he's coming up but before we talk any more about writers and immediately yeah, yeah. Dig the other five people who are watching us and let live and turn <laughs> off, I want to talk about expectations, Joe. Yeah. There's yeah. something I'd be calling, and I'm going to mention this for both of my questions. There's a ceiling and a floor. Mm -hmm. The floor for the Giants has been about the same over the last few seasons. Now with an extra game, you could say 5-12, and 6-11, and 11, although they were 6-10 and 10 last year. Mm -hmm. What... I want, to, I want to know what your ceiling is for the Giants, what would could be considered a successful season, but a realistic ceiling. What is the next true step for Daniel Jones? Okay. And now are you just talking about number of wins type of success? I'm, I'm talking about number of wins and possibly do you think this is a team that should be a playoff team really also? Okay. So easy, easy answer to that is if the defense stays healthy, and they play to their capabilities with getting Lorenzo Carter back, getting Zimenez back, bringing in this kid, Olegari, that everybody was so excited about when we drafted him last year. If he comes back by midseason and really gets into some sort of form, um, you know, the linebackers are very good. The safeties are good. Having McKinney now for a full season, I think that this team will be in – as many games as they were last year, plus a few more. So if you say they won six games last year and maybe one of them, the offense won, I would say they should win eight games this year and then give one to the offense. So I'll say nine is what I would say is a successful season for this team. Um, they have a weird schedule that, like I said, it may be kind of stacked in some places. They don't, they don't play – you know, they play some weird games and they play they, the last three games are the division games. So, you know, you're, you're going to get all those ones late again, which is makes it difficult. Um, but they don't have a lot of Sunday night games. They don't have a lot of Monday night games because they didn't win that many games last year. So and you figure Philly's not any good at all. Um, they're playing a couple of teams that are just downright awful. So I would say the floor for this team is nine. Um, let's say eight. It's tough with 17 now, right? You don't want to <laughs> eight and nine, nine and eight is where I think is still a success. It's still a step forward. And then 11 is top. Um, I don't see teams winning more than even with 17. I don't see a lot of teams winning 13 games. So I'm going to say 11 would be the ceiling. I will say this, by the way, what you, what Joe just said, the Giants last year were in 
until the final month of the season after the Seahawks game, where I think the house of cards came tumbling down a little bit, whether it be injuries or people just watching more video of them. That team was in all but two games going into that stretch last year. You can San say Francisco, that San Francisco, San Francisco and actually all but one. San Francisco was really the only one, and that was just a weird game as is. So keep that in mind. This team was in was one or could have easily won 12 games last year, and that's not an optimistic. That's not being yeah, like no, – it, it came down to that's a two-point two point conversion against Tampa. They had a first and goal against the Rams. They should have beaten Dallas except for those two throws that Andy Dalton made, the only two throws he made all year. So a drop I mean, pass by Evan Ingram as well in Philadelphia. Yeah, the uh, drop ball by game. Ingram. You know, all of those t- all of those games are honestly winnable games. I mean, they got a pass yeah. to Phoenix call on the two-point conversion and they picked up the play. Yeah, I so mean uh, they, they were, were so close to all of those. Right. And if you think yeah. about it, if those four plays go their way they're 10 and 6 instead of 6 and 10 right or if half of them go they're in the playoffs and they get to beat Tampa before they get the easy draw and get to go Uh, play yes by the way (laughs) by the way this team should minimum go four and two in the division this year and that's that's being optimistic because they should have done on again could have should have would have should have been six no against the division last year and again that's definite fact they should have been sick. They should have swept that division last year. Agreed. Moving on to a team that's not going to sweep their division in any year, probably for the next 15 years. We can bet on that. The Jets, do you think the Jets are going to sweep the division? No. The Jets did not make it for the Rabbi, I mean, 15 years. I'm serious. I, I, I just, I'm just it. saying sweep the division. Yeah, and I just can't see that it. happening. The Jets did not make it through their training camp unscathed. We'll get to that in a few. But their season starts with a revenge game against them, of course. As Zach Wilson of the Jets, who looked pretty good in the preseason, but we've talked about preseason before, goes up against his predecessor, Sam Darnold. Dun, dun, dun. And, oh, yeah, Adam Gates is going to be crying in his room, watching his failures probably has some damn good successes that day on the field. So let's ask Joe some questions about Gang Green, starting with the best QB whisperer since Adam Gase, Mr. Jay Kaplan. Thank you, Rabbi. So you alluded to Zach Wilson. And the Zach Wilson that we saw during the joint practices with the Eagles at the end of camp was very different than the one we saw during OTAs back in May and June. He's got a much better grasp of the playbook, is much more comfortable within Mike LaFleur's offense, and it's allowing his athleticism and passing ability to come to the fore. That being said, whether it was OTAs, minicamp, or training camp, Wilson was seemingly always under pressure. And it wasn't because he was holding the ball too long, but the defensive front consistently was getting through. The Jets' own pass rush got through regularly in practice. Carl Lawson specifically, before he got hurt, just flat out dominated Mekhi Becton, as did the Packers and the Eagles uh, pass rushers who joined the joint workouts. When Wilson did have time to throw, which he did against the Giants and the Packers, he was able to showcase his ability to, as one Eagles beat writer said, fling it. That just seldom happened in practice. Now, a few weeks ago, and I found this interesting when I read the article in The Athletic, Wilson explained that he was experimenting while things didn't count. The NFL is different than college. Players are faster. So Wilson wanted to see what he could and could not get away with. There was one throw that he forced to wide receiver Elijah Moore that linebacker C.J. Mosley nearly picked off. Wilson was curious if he could get it in there, so he tried. Now, Mosley flew into the passing lane and got his hands on it. Wilson said, now he knows not to try something like that which is something you kind of like to see how a rookie quarterback is processing, you know, the game speed and what trying to see what he, his athletic ability will and will not allow him to do at the next level. <clears throat> so with all that being said, Joe, you know, what should the expectations be for the rookie, you know, post training camp as we you know, get ready to kick off the season? Yeah, I, I think you should, again, I think what the organizational, expectation should be forget the fan base because they're wacky right um, i'm talking purely you know, always wacky they, let's be fair <laughs> here that's their trade that's their hallmark it's, that's a fair you know it's a fair assessment um i think i think organizationally they should and i think they do have tepid 
you know, thoughts that the kid ha- is athletic, that he's smart, that he's going to be able to process this. I like all the stuff you just said, Jay, but you hope there's something that he, he you hope he doesn't do everything and go, gee, I can't do any of that. <laughs> you know, you hope there is something that he finds that he's comfortable with, that he's good with. Hey, even Mark Sanchez, they, they realized if you go play action and cut the field in half, he had, he had good enough feet to get outside, give him two receivers to throw to him, he was fine. I mean, you can you can make anybody a success if you do what they do well. Right. So take the first half of the year, figure that out, see what he does, see what he likes to do, see what will that you can get away with, that you can block up, that you can make some plays from. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't I wouldn't count on too many 15 play drives. I would try to get some big chunks at certain times and, and run the ball if you can. You know, they're in a rough spot. They don't have running backs. They don't have a good offensive line. They don't have any wide receivers that are, you know, healthy. It's it's very difficult um, to, to build on this. So yeah. as an organization, if he goes out and wins you six games this year after winning what they went two last year. Yeah. So, I mean, if they go out and win six this year and, and he doesn't throw 30 interceptions, you know, he's not Jameis Winston. Doesn't pull a Jameis. You know, right. he, he actually has – some skills and become a starting good. quarterback for the New Orleans Saints. That's yeah, yeah, exactly. right. <laughs> that he actually understands what he's doing and doesn't continue to make the same mistake over and over again, which is, you know, again, is that what we'll see from him? Can he hold on to the ball when he starts getting hit? You know, is he going to just, it, does he understand how to get rid of it when he needs to mm-hmm. get rid of it? All of that stuff is part of the process, as you know, Jay, very well. And so to me, you have to take him as a nothing, as a raw talent Yep. and look at him at week eight after, you know, let's do a show after week eight, do a show at the end of the year. And we say, okay, how did Zach Wilson progress through the year? What did he do well? What has he got to work on? Same thing as everybody else, but he's not going to suddenly be Joe Montana. He's no. going to work his way through this. And, you know, again, he may have been drafted a little too high. You know, a lot of, uh, there was a lot of that talk, but a lot of that talk was started by Colin Cowherd, who knows nothing. No. So. And Joe, you and I are both of the, of the philosophy. If that's your guy and he's sitting there and you believe that that's your guy, it doesn't matter what everyone else is thinking. You take your guy. And you can't just say, Oh, this other guy has a bigger arm. So that means it's not about that. The number of guys about. who came into the NFL with big arms that are no longer no. playing in the league. If you and I had a nickel for every one of them, we'd own an NFL team. By now. <laughs> so <laughs> I think that, I think the um, I, I think that the answer to that question is any progress he makes to the point where you can say this is what this kid does well. This is what we have to work on. Yeah, he he didn't make that. Hey, look at that! In week three, he would have thrown that ball. Instead, he pulled it down and ran with it in week six. You know that those type of, of yep. progressions, those type of improvements, are what you really have to do, and and that's what they'll do internally. That's what Joe Douglas will do. That's what the coaching staff will do. The fans won't do it, but um, everybody no, else. You know, with that team. the guys are three. I do. The guy's a three-year project. Hopefully they find a running back. I actually, so funny about that. I don't think it's a three-year project. I think you've seen enough stuff that you're going to get. No. Nope. Things in year one. No. Nope. Stop. He hasn't, played Jay, you're not, he hasn't played a real He hasn't defense. played a real down in a real game yet. Yeah. Yeah, there is Trevor Lawrence and he looked and he kind of looked like shit. We can't annoy anybody. I think this is a I think you're gonna see a lot more flash from Wilson than you think this year. No, but yeah, I think no, that I, I it won't be consistent. Uh, but and again, but that's what, we're just, what we were just saying while you were enjoying dinner was that's not I'm what still it's enjoying about. dinner now <laughs> right now. So we're going to be continuing not, enjoying it while you guys are going on. That's that's not what that's about. Is yes, he's yeah. going to make some big plays. He's going to make some plays out of the pocket. He's going to do some things. That doesn't mean that's who he is. Yeah. You no, have that. to see what's consistent once people start game playing against him once they figure out what he is. And again, it's not an individual sport. He's going to need a running game. He's going to need somebody to throw the ball to. As I said to Jay jokingly in last show, he's a window thrower. 
well, someone's got to be standing in the window. Otherwise, it's a waste of time. Yep. So, exactly. you know, get an offensive line together, and we'll see you in a couple of years. Yeah. Anthony, speaking of external ways that the team looks, <laughs> let's go to Anthony with his question. Yeah. Well, I, I enjoy more team. ribs, by the way, guys. <laughs> I have, my apologies, by the way. Have it, I've been working like a dog today. This is my time. I'm going Go. to enjoy it. Bye bye. Enjoy your dinner. We got this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> By the way, Joe, if there's any team that probably would have do away with the uh, joint practices next season, it's the Jets. Like, in a span of 48 hours, <laughs> it seems like the injury bug just ravished this team, particularly losing Carl Lawson for the season. He was the, the big free agent signing that was supposed to be a key addition to Robert Sala's new 4-3 scheme on a defensive side. And, and you also look at the fact that they have a couple of uh, – another injury, too, Gerard um, – Javon Davis, the backup uh, safety, is also out for the season. And they're also dealing with uh, Jamison Crowder being questionable because of COVID. Mm-hmm. I, I don't want to – and this is my question to you. How does the Jets, in particular Robert Sala, deal with these rash of injuries before they even get to play their first game of the season? I mean, that's a – it's a, a lot of, of adjusting to deal with or just in the last few weeks – considering the, the Jets really haven't, because of the preseason, obviously, we haven't played a lot of these guys together, and you're coming in with new schemes and, and new coaches, obviously. Well, um, how does the team adjust to, to these absences seemingly all coming at them at one time? Well, he's, you know, I, I consider him a very good coach, football coach. Um, I think he did a wonderful job in San Francisco, so – I don't think he has to worry about what this team looks like again for the first couple of years. Nobody should give him a hard time with he doesn't have enough talent around. He's not the guy that does that. It's not like he's been here for five years or 10 years. So you walk in the door, everybody knows who these guys were that got hurt. Um, I do think joint practices can be run successfully and can be run haphazardly and not work out the giants. You know, Joe Judge said he talked to Stefanski and he talked to Belichick for months. And they they emailed back and forth and they texted and they had meetings all night, the night before, so that they understood the tempo, how people were going to be treated, who was going to sit out, who was not going to touch anybody, and the whole thing so that they protected themselves. I think a lot of these guys put these together and didn't spend that much time (coughs) figuring this out. And him being a new head coach, I think he has to learn all that stuff and Again, deal with people he knows. You know, Joe Judge and Stefanski played high school ball together. They know each other for 30, for their whole lives. Obviously, he knows Belichick for 25 years. You got to deal with guys you know. You can't just call some team up and say, hey, let's go practice together and not have all these meetings and not understand how it's going to be run. So I think they'll figure that part out. I I don't think Salah should worry about or or should be concerned about what anybody's going to say about this team not having a full complement of players, you know, but we'll see how he is with next man up philosophy, getting guys ready to play. Does he rotate guys in or does he just leave them hang hang out there to dry? I think it's dangerous. Again, when you pick a head coach, that was this big successful defensive coach who had a ton of players in San Francisco and you bring them into your team. And for some reason, everybody thinks, it's the scheme that's going to give them the results and the the names on the back don't count Mm -hmm. in the NFL. The names on the back of the jerseys do count Chip Kelly. That matters who it is. You don't have 17 wide receivers and 22 running backs. And they're all the top guys from the, in the country. You need to build a team. You need to build depth. You need to find out what you have. So they're going to struggle in the beginning because of these injuries, they are because they don't have any depth because, because the cover was bare when he got there. But hopefully all these beat, beat riders and, and fans understand that he's starting from scratch. Of course. And he has to build this. And so I don't think he should be worried one bit about what anybody says. He should walk out there and says, the guys play hard. Hopefully they play hard. Hopefully they play for 60 minutes. Hopefully they give the best effort they can. Hopefully he doesn't do what the last Jet coach did was, that cornerback can't cover one-on-one, but I'm going to blitz everybody and see what happens. Well, you found out what happened. So. Yeah. As long as he's smart about it and he's good in his post-game um, understanding of the media. And what did Joe Judge say last year? 
proud of these guys. They played for 60 minutes. We were in every game. That's why we have conditioning. That's why we play with fundamentals. That's why we play. They had two penalties in that Patriots game, the Giants. That's what he wants to see. That's, that's the victory for him. Yeah. Them playing as hard as they can without making any mistakes, without shooting themselves in the foot. If the Jets can get to that point by the middle of the season, then the season's a success for them. Forget if they win any of those games. Right. Be because the key is, is that you're bringing him in to change the culture. And part of that is if you're Jets fans and you're looking across at the other locker room and you're hearing what's coming out of that coach's mouth and you're seeing the way that team is playing, as much as you may not like the guys you're sharing met life with, you kind of want your team doing that. So if he's able to replicate that type of a culture where these guys are competitive, the, you know, he's got them playing hard. Uh, I think that's where the baseline has to be in terms of, you know, what's the improvement under the new administration from the last. Yeah, and I don't think it should be based on wins. I don't think it has anything to do with that. I think this one shouldn't be. This one yeah. definitely it leads into be your this. question, Rabbi. Well, no, this one definitely shouldn't be because the Jets have a long way to go and have an actual tough division to be a part of because all three of the teams above them should be playoff teams or could be playoff teams. Okay. And I ask you the same question I asked with the Giants, but obviously there is more realistic expectations for the Jets. What do you consider a win for Robert Sala in his first season? I, I think what I just said, if they are able to exactly. stay in games, if they're able to not shoot themselves in the foot, they're able to not take that stupid rough in the pass for penalty that loses them a game. If they if they can actually execute the defense they're taught and they learn it and they learn from their mistakes and Zach Wilson, again, they learn what he's about and what he can do and what he can't do, and they don't put him in bad situations. I think, I think he's got the easier – he has the easier win if you're going to look at the two teams because oh, of course. there's of course. nothing – because even if you want to just talk numbers, if he wins five games, you can say, oh, he won 125% of last year, 150% of last year. You know, you can couch that any way you want, but I think – Getting that team to play 60 minutes, getting some professionalism out of it, finding some leaders, whether it's if it's going to be Zach, fine. I don't think you got to count on CJ Mosley because he's only going to be around here for another year or so. You need to develop and find some leaders and guys that not guys that want to get out of here. You know, the, the safety yeah. already wants to get traded. Well, if you're going to develop some leaders, let's put them now in an organization that they want to stay with. And they want to re up with, and they want to play for, and they want to wow. keep the jet, and that's that's important. So. This is going to be a very interesting group, just because you you either this the floor is even lower than it was a season ago, which I just don't think is possible, or I think we might be actually seeing some notable success. I think it's going to be a fun season mm -hmm. at MetLife Stadium. No, no, it's going to be a successful season for either side. But I think it's going to be fun. And that's all that really matters to me because it hasn't been a lot of fun in the last four or five years. Yeah, I'm, no, I'm honest to God to say about it. But we're going to move on and we're going to move on to everybody else because we have to talk division. So we're going to preview one team, each division. It doesn't matter if you think they're going to win it or not. It's, you got some intriguing story. You got a lot of intriguing storylines this year as we have a full, seemingly more complete. NFL 2021. Let's go to the AFC. Two-time defending AFC champs are the Kansas City Chiefs, and they don't look like they're going to be stopped. Can they make it three in a row? It's time for our division-by-division division preview. Joe, we're going to start with the AFC East. Get the tables. The Bills Mafia is back. They're defending <laughs> champs of the AFC East, and they look about as good as the Bills have looked in about 25 to 30 years, Joe. <laughs> Yeah, I agree with you. And, and that comment you made the other before about the Jets now winning the, all the games in the division for the next 15 years, that's because they're not going to beat Buffalo. Mm -hmm. And that team is going to be stacked. They have good ownership. They have money to spend. <coughs> they're smart about how they do it. They have their quarterback all set. They picked the right guy. He was successful from year two. He, they know what they have. And so now you build from there and you build from there until you have to give them that $30 million a year contract and 
Which and you they got have already, by the yeah, way. But, so. you know, but you know, you still have a little bit of room because you're going to have to sign a few guys here and there to make it a complete team. But as far as playing in the AFC East, you know, the decision Belichick made, I think he knows he's not there yet. Um, starting with Mac Jones and seeing where he goes. Obviously, the Jets aren't there yet. And Miami is the fact that they're still not really positive if we should trade for Deshaun Watson or we should uh, play the guy we have or we should play another guy or we should find somebody else. That's not going to go well. Um, and their defense fell off after Patrick Graham left down in Miami. It didn't look as good as it should have. Um, so you see if that comes back. But I think easily this is Buffalo's division. Um to dominate the way the Patriots dominated all those years is you beat the Jets twice, you beat New England, and you beat Miami one of those times, and all of a sudden, voila, you have five wins, and now you go play a couple other teams and that are down like Carolina and, and the Colts and a couple of other teams that are fighting in Houston and a couple of those other things, and you find yourself in the playoffs. So I, I think that they're uh, – they're stacked. They're ready to go. They're only going to get better year after year. You're going to see for the next couple of years and get stronger and stronger. And to me, that's the team in the, in the East for a while. I've never seen a team who has hummed better <laughs> offensively than the Bills. They're good. They're good at all strengths in the field. It's just a question of can they get to the level of Kansas City? Because in the two games that they played last year, it looked like they were nowhere near that level, but we'll talk about kids. Well, we'll talk about the West in a second. Jay, I would love for the AFC North preview to be about Joe Burrow's second year with the Bengals and how that team can develop. But unfortunately, we know what show we know what show this is. Go ahead and talk about this. First. Well, you know, look. I, I mean, obviously, I'm watching the Steelers, and I said during our training camp show that this team had a lot of questions that needed answers, and unfortunately, some of those questions are still unanswered. The good thing for the Steelers is that every team in the division has questions. I mean, you look at it, guys. I mean, the Ravens lost J.K. Dobbins to injury. They lost Jeff Juden from their pass rush to free agency. How much is that going to hurt? Can even a run-focused team like Baltimore overcome summer <coughs> injury to three of their wide receivers? Rookie first-rounder Rashad Bateman is out until at least week four due to groin surgery. Miles Boykin is also out until at least week four of the hamstring. And number one wide receiver Marquise Brown's hamstring issues caused him to miss the entire preseason. Offensive line had changes. Lamar Jackson battled COVID during camp. The Browns, yeah, on paper, they have a loaded roster and they get Odell Beckham back from injury. They have a wrecking ball on in defensive end, Miles Garrett. Denzel Ward's back at cornerback, but they added four new starters via free agency. Starting with Jadavian Clowney, he's looking to record, resurrect his career, obviously, Garrett. They have potentially two more through the draft, beginning with cornerback Greg Newsom the second. And think about this, guys. You know, the, the Browns were closer to the bottom 10 in most major defensive categories last season. Give me a salute, Rabbi. Can Baker Mayfield repeat the excellent first season he had in Kevin, head coach Kevin Stefanski's offense? Now that every coordinator, offense, defensive coordinator has a book on them, your Bengals, Rabbi. Expected to, unfortunately, dude, I think they're going to be uh, residing in the cellar again. Joe Burrow, right. you know, is recovering from an ACL injury that ruined his rookie season. Yeah, the Bengals drafted his former LSU teammate, Jamar Chase, to be his, you know, his to be A.J. Green to his Andy Dalton, hopefully both of them being better. Um, <laughs> go along with running back Joe oh, Mixon. But hey, yes. But Chase has had drop issues this summer, which doesn't bode well for a team that was going to be led by its offense. And that brings me to the Steelers. And they're projected to have one of the toughest schedules in the NFL season, in the NFL this season. So they're going to go as far as Ben Roethlisberger and the defense will take them. Big Ben's arm looks stronger as evidenced by the increase in deep balls thrown during 11 on 11 and seven on seven periods in, in practice, as well as in the preseason game against the Lions, which is Ben's only preseason action. First round, you know, pick running back Najee Harris has looked as advertised but the offensive line is still in flux. Every member of the starting five was in a new position until this past week when a change was made that sent Chuck that sent Chuck Okorafor back to right tackle after he spent the majority of camp at left tackle and, you know, put rookie fourth rounder Dan Moore Jr. Um, at the left tackle slot. Most of this was due to Zach Banner being limited and being slower than anticipated to recover from his ACL 
injury, and he's on IR along with defensive end Stephen Stephen Tuitt and running back Anthony McFarland. Stewart was Tuitt was second on the team in sacks last year with 11. That's a huge hole in the defensive front three. McFarland's performance in camp um, so wowed the offensive staff that he was set up to have a big role. Um, you know, as the number two guy behind Harrison and new offensive coordinator Matt Canada's offense. So these really hurt as the earliest they can return is week three. Look, and here's the other thing. No one showed themselves capable of replacing Mike Hilton as a slot corner. So now Cam Sutton, who was supposed to replace Mike Nelson on the outside corner opposite Joe Hayden, has to slide into the slot and sub packages, forcing the Steelers to rely on relatively untested James Pierre at the outside corner. TJ Watt's extension is still not sorted out. And, you know, you, you hear doesn't the defensive coordinator, Kevin Butler, he's not sounding overly optimistic that he's going to have Watt, on, you know, on as part of the starting 11 on game one. Though, uh, from what I'm hearing, the prevailing opinion of uh, Mark Caboli, who's the Steelers beat writer for The Athletic, is that it will get done in advance of the September 12th kickoff against Buffalo. Wait a minute. I thought I thought beat writers for people who too not to listen or be trusted no, no, from, no, no, no. from 30 minutes ago no, 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 on this no, no, show. No. Local beat writers who follow the team this. every day. Those are the guys who have the insight. Did we Those hear about this before? About this? Stop like five it. Let me talk Just about this. stop it and let me finish, okay? Wise ass. <laughs> Buffalo is going to be a hell of a start for the Steelers. Uh, you know, as you know, Joe talked about, and as you've mentioned, Rabbi, you know, look, the Steelers still have a very deep group of playmaking wide receivers for Big Ben to throw to. They have a ball hawking safety in Minka Fitzpatrick. Linebacker Devin Bush is back from injury. They added former Jag Joe Schober to play inside linebacker alongside him, which finally gives the Steelers a linebacker who can actually cover someone. And Chris Boswell is one of the best kickers in the NFL, one aberrant season aside. Look, this is a team that could have the football bounce, you know, the right way, and they'll challenge for the division title that the fan base considers their birthright, or they can also have their first below 500 season of the Tomlin era. As I always tell folks, they're the Steelers. They never do anything the easy way. This season ain't going to be any different, which is why they're going to be worth watching. They go below 500 in in the Tomlin era, anyway, shape, or form. For God's sakes, they had Mason Rudolph at quarterback, and they did not go below 500 for for most of this season. (laughs) Hey, it's one of the most. It's one of the most. It's one of the best organizations in football, and one of the from start to finish. The ceiling might be a little lower now for them because of Ben's age and because of how a lot of other teams in the division look. But Pittsburgh, nine wins guaranteed to me if it's below that then it's it's a turn for the worst but we've saw the giants do the same thing all right anthony we know the chiefs are the class of the afc but the afc west looks a lot better this year and it all starts with that other team in los angeles california yeah, I look at the AFC West, and, and honestly, the only team that could think that could probably give the Chiefs any kind of trouble in the division is the Los Angeles Chargers. Now, here's the thing. They get to play in a sold-out Sophie Stadium this time around, so that'll be a big help. But also, hey, look, they have a new head coach. Anthony Lynn is, Anthony Lynn is gone. Now you have Brandon Staley coming in. And no need to acquire because Justin Herbert is the undisputed starter going into this season. So we won't have none of that controversy. Oh, uh, no, no, we're relaxed. As, as far as missed miss hydrochloroquine shots uh, being in the wrong areas, that won't happen this year. Look, Justin Herbert's coming off an offensive rookie of the year season. He threw through 31 touchdowns, 4,300 yards. The Chargers offense have weapons. You still got Keenan Allen. On the outside, you still have Mike Williams. You got Jalen Guyton, Tyron Johnson, Austin Eckler coming out of the backfield. On the defensive side, Aaron, uh, James getting back healthy. And you also add Ashanti Samuel Jr. Um, into that defensive backfield. And Joey Bosa being moved around. Um, when you look at the Chargers, it's going to be it's going to come down to late game situations. We know the Chargers are notorious for finding ways of being in close games and losing them. And last year, I actually think that cost Anthony Lynn a, 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 his coaching job. Just the Chargers' inability to finish games uh, late, you know, ha- as the season wore on. Uh, I can count by maybe four or five games they probably had a chance to win. That could have made a difference in possibly uh, sneaking into the playoffs, especially the expanded postseason with the extra wild card. Look, it, um, when you look at the, the Chargers, it's going to be it's going to come down to 
can they finish games off late? And the other two teams in the AFC West, the Broncos, the only chance they have really is if their defense to get back to form with a healthy Von Miller and Bradley Chubb being the bookends um, on the defensive end. And if Teddy Bridgewater can actually be somewhat of a manageable quarterback and not lose games for them, and you don't know what the heck is going on with the Raiders. I just got to be honest. The Raiders could be anywhere from a team that could be decent enough to make a postseason run, as they did last year, or they could be the team in the last month of the season, particularly that Saturday afternoon game against Miami. Well, <laughs> this magic struck the struck and pretty much cost them any shot at making a playoffs. So uh, we, we know the Chiefs are, are, are the, the class of the AMC West. They're going to be, it's going to be a matter of when they clinch the division, not if. Yep. But um, the Chargers could be anywhere between that nine and 10 win team that could possibly get in as a, as a wild card. I mean, playing in the super wild card weekend uh, as a visiting team. Or they could be a team that, because maybe they find another way of losing two or three games in the fourth quarter in the final minute, miss the playoffs again. But it's going to be, it's going to be two days. Can they finish games late? And can Justin Herbert? Uh, build off of what he did in year one with year two, and knowing that now defensive coordinators have had several months to game plan for him, and it's that, that sophomore season with quarterbacks we always got to keep our eye on because teams get time to adjust to you now. And we know one of, key, one of Justin Herbert's key weaknesses is that he has the arm strength, however, doesn't quite give up the ball fast enough. And if teams adjusted that a little, uh, it's had several months to adjust to that. Can he adjust to uh, defenses and particularly the secondary be a little more aggressive on those pass plays? Yeah. So the Chargers are going to be an interesting team to watch. They uh, are. They absolutely are, Anthony. But I do want to ask Joe a question since he lives in Los Angeles. Joe, the Chargers' first four home games at SoFi Stadium are Dallas, Las Vegas, Cleveland, and New England, four fan bases that are pretty prominent in the NFL. How many of those games will actually feel like home games for the Los Angeles Chargers? That, it was Zero. exactly it was exactly what I was going to say to you. It's just because they got a brand new stadium doesn't mean you're going to be the there. They are yeah, always they, the second sisters. But one of my referee friends has season tickets and he's had them since the old stadium, and he has four beautiful seats where he sits. And he said he already said. Cowboys tickets are selling for six hundred dollars a piece, and they're almost all gone. Mm-hmm. And so you are going to see at least, you know, they played in a stadium last year that held 35,000 people and they couldn't fill it. Two years ago, a place that has 60,000 people. And that just means the away fans get to fill it up. So don't count on the fan base being any help to to a San Diego team uh, in any way, shape, or form. A San Diego team in a Los Angeles city. There you go. As simple as that. Rob, I just want to reference something that Anthony said talking about, you know, Justin Herbert. <clears throat> has a slower release than, than the charges would like. What's going to be interesting for me to watch is how often, especially against veteran secondaries and veteran defensive coordinators, where the coverage is set up to bait him into throwing to a particular receiver that looks like he's open, but because they know that his release is a little bit slower, he's not going to see the defensive back who's spying him and will be able to jump that route and make that pick because he's slow to deliver. So it'll be interesting to see how often uh, coverages get disguised to bait him into making bad throws that someone with a slower release is could get into trouble with. It's going to be something. And, and, and also, Jay, I, I add this as well, Jay, what's going to, how is he going to perform in cover threes? Because we see linebackers in that cover three formation kind of dropping back into coverage. And they are always looking into the backfield. It, does he pick up on that linebacker before especially, the linebacker right, picks right. up on that on that Guys, route? Especially if that linebacker starts to look like he's going to blitz and then drops back into coverage, and he winds up in the open air in an area that Herbert thought was open, but it's not. We're going to get example one right out of the gate because week one they're at Washington. And there's no better team that disguises defensive coverages who have the people that can go at you like the Washington football team. All right. So the AFC South is usually the most boring division out of all of them in the NFL. And this year is 
kind of no different. I mean, the Jaguars do have Trevor Lawrence. Trevor Lawrence is going to be a generational quarterback, but he's in the wrong system and he's playing for the wrong coach. I think yeah. the only reason we're going to be interested in Urban Meyer this year is how bad of a coach he is. He's already almost, he's basically ruined players' morale by keeping one of his friends on the team for longer than they should have. He's basically almost cost himself a lot of money from the NFLPA by saving vaccination. That's had something to do with the cuts. He's a guy who wants to run a college program with an NFL team. Can't work. Nope. The Houston Texans have Deshaun Watson on their staff, and guess who their starting quarterback is on Sunday? <laughs> the man who Anthony, the man who Anthony just referred to, is the guy who got stuck with the needle last year to make Justin Herbert the starter. Tyron <laughs> Taylor. And those two teams play each other on Sunday, and somebody has to go one and zero. And I don't think there's too many wins coming out of that group this year. The Titans are boring, but the Titans are very, very good. They have Derrick Henry, who can give you the thunder, and then all of a sudden, A.J. Brown and Julio Jones. What better of a one-two combination do you have if they're both healthy? It's one of the best wide receiving cores out there. And Ryan Tannehill, his second act is probably one of the better second acts we've seen in a long time in sports. However, the Colts make this division very, very interesting in many, many, many ways. They have a really good defense, although they've lost some people over this preseason. They've had some good moves out there, but I think the one thing that I'm very, very interested in is to see what happens with Carson Wentz. There is so much about the Carson wentz Frank Wright relationship with Wright was the offensive coordinator for their Super Bowl winning run in Super Bowl 52. Obviously, Wentz only made it to week 14, but... Wentz was an MVP candidate. Wentz was a guy who you could give a big contract to. And then he got injured, and then it's never really been the same for him. So I'm very curious to see what Wentz 4.0, I guess, since he's had so many reboots and injuries, happens to be this season. Because if he's terrible, you're bringing in Jacob Eason or Sam Ellinger, and this team is a four to five win team, maybe six, and the Titans will easily win this division. But if one shows even a fraction of that MVP season, both teams could easily be nine, 10 to 11 win teams. And we could have at least two teams, like we did last year, come out of this division in the playoffs. The Colts took a big ass gamble getting Carson Wentz, although they got him for pretty much nothing. They got him for a second <laughs> round pick. But they don't have any real backup in that spot. So if Carson Wentz fails, the Colts are back to the drawing board in 2022. And this is an organization that's meant to win now with the roster that they have. Colts will be the one of the most interesting teams in the NFL. I tell you, Rabbi, the thing, the team that interests me is the, <sighs> is the Titans. Uh, they've got all the talent in the world and that offense returns, you know, three of their big playmakers and they added Julio. But what's going to be interesting for me is Arthur Smith, who was a wizard as, as a play caller and constantly, you know, put both Tannehill and the rest of that offense in really good position to succeed. They promote Todd Downing, who's the TE coach last year, to be, you know, an offensive coordinator. And it'll be interesting to see his first time calling plays in that offense. It's going to be interesting to see, you know, if, if, if the way he calls a game, you know, keep, keeps things going or if these guys take a step back, you know, because this is a you know, first year as an offensive coordinator, you know, it's it's takes some getting used to. So I'm going to be watching to see what that happens because Arthur Smith and Ryan Tannehill had such a great connection last year and it showed up in the results on the field. So I'll be interested to see if there's any backsliding. Well, let's say that the Titans seemingly have a ceiling. Can that ceiling be raised is really the question that we're asking. Yep. Okay, gents. So Tom Brady went into his pinky in the brain mode woke up and decided once again to do the same thing he always does, take over the world, though this time he did it in the NFC. The Bucks are defending NFC and, of course, Super Bowl champions. God, seven rings for Tom Brady. He won it, he got it. All right, we're going to go division by division again. And Joe, we talked a little bit about that football team from Washington before. Let's talk about them again now. Yeah, I think they're the most intriguing group because – as has been pointed out to me before, they have the best defensive line in football. 
um, without without a doubt. I don't think you know when you have four number one picks across the front, you're going you're going to be pretty good. They they shored up some more of that defense in the off season. They've got a couple of young guys. The biggest question on this whole team is you still left yourself, you know, after the failure of, of Dwayne Haskins and, you know, that usually sets your team back a while. And, and here's the, I think here's the dilemma that you have in Washington is if Fitzpatrick goes in and does his usual six fantastic wins, six horrible losses, yeah. the other five games will be left to a flip of a coin. <laughs> Let's say you win eight games this year. And now you're picking 14th next year. Well, you're still not going to get a quarterback and you're still, you're not going to be able to get the guy that you're playing for. They, they almost would have been better off again last year, not winning six games and getting into the playoffs and, and, you know, getting to that point where you didn't, you didn't have a quarterback to pick. So going with Fitzpatrick is about the only, you know, I don't think it was the only thing they could have done. We just talked about a couple of guys that were out there that you could have brought into your team to see if you could have gotten maybe three or four years out of somebody Bring in Fitzpatrick at his age. And just knowing that there's a possibility of him getting hurt and you have nobody behind him um, makes this team very intriguing because that's what you're going to look for each week. He's going to be the reason this team wins and loses games. And that's going to be kind of scary after a while. Um, because they don't have a complete dominant defense, they only have the one half of it that's really good. That's going to win them some games. That's going to get them to some places. But I don't know. You know, they they don't have a, a big running back. The guy because the guy got hurt again last year. You got you don't have really great wide receivers. He's going to win some games for you because he is who he is. But I don't think he's going to be able to take them suddenly from six wins to eleven wins. Just, just on his own, right? Uh, you know, you're uh, not bringing in again. You're not bringing in Carson Wentz, who, if he stayed healthy, he might no. be able to do that for you. You didn't bring no. in Teddy Bridgewater. You didn't bring. You brought in Ryan Fitzpatrick, who he's fantastic. But and he were and he's going to work well with Ron Rivera. The problem oh, is Joe, there are days when he was going to lose games for you horribly. Well, Joe, we talked about it before with the same thing with the Giants. The Redskins defense is so good that number 17 is all he has to do, except Fitzpatrick is not a game manager. He's no. never been a game manager. He's no. a guy who wants to go for 270 and three touchdowns or 270 and five interceptions. It's, so the prediction really I, no middle ground. The prediction I came up with today was there's going to be a game where he throws four or five touchdown passes and wins a game for you, and there's going to be a game where he throws four interceptions. And he loses the game for you, yeah. even though the defense only gave up 21 points or 17. And that only, yeah. And if that only happens once exactly. for each scenario, I'll be surprised. Yeah. Exactly. Right. And, so I think that's they, the thing. I think he's the six up, six down, flip a coin, the other five guy. And I don't think absolutely. that goes well for them. So. And in the NFC East, who knows? That might be the division where you need the six up, six down guy. Anthony. No. Kirk Cousins, Vikings. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah, I have the uh, the NFC North, which is going to be uh, renamed the Aaron Rodgers Revenge Tour this season. Uh, that's number one. But the Minnesota Vikings. Hold on a second. How does an MVP get a revenge tour is really the one thing I need to know the answer to. Because well, Aaron Rodgers, you know, and I don't think it, <laughs> I think it we've seen, we've seen a I think we've seen this offseason that Aaron Rodgers doesn't need much to get slighted. So he doesn't need much for motivation either. Not to mention he's hosted Jeopardy. So I got to give him a little credit. Wasn't he going to get traded the week after the Super Bowl was over? Right? I was a little little agitated. It's a revenge tour, Rabbi, because Aaron Rodgers is coming into the season with a chip the size of the entire city of Milwaukee on his shoulder. That he put on himself. It doesn't <laughs> matter. <laughs> Jordan did the same thing. It doesn't matter. Uh, come okay. On. Well, get into the Vikings. Remember that uh, whole COVID thing we were talking about earlier? Yeah, Kirk Cousins is one of the many uh, 
anti-vaxxers, questionable vaccination guys. That's in the link still. Uh, but that's besides the point. Uh, the Vikings, look, the Vikings, for what it's worth, they were a team, they, they were a team that was just decimated with injuries last year, particularly on the defensive end. And it got so bad that um, they gave up six rushing touchdowns on Christmas Day. Um, it was just like the worst. That was like literally the bottom out part of that defense. They went from top 10 to 29th, 27th overall, 29th in scoring. So that's how bad it was. But look, um, offensively, they have weapons. You know, just uh, you look at um, you got just uh, Jefferson, the, the young receiver, showed a lot of promise. Uh, and and Kirk Cousins is showing that he's a man. good quarterback. Yeah, yeah, Dalvin Cook as well. Yeah, no, it's just Matt. And Kirk Cousins is showing. Yeah, and yeah, I'm dealing as well. Kirk Cousins is showing he can be a good quarterback. Maybe not great, but good enough. To be a quarterback, he needs to get onto a better start than he did last year. He threw 10 interceptions in the first six games. And the Vikings are going to at least make the playoffs. He's got to be much better than that. Defensively, they get, they're going to be healthy. Harrison Smith uh, is back, healthy, is 100%. And, it, it, they get, and they're one of the teams that they're pretty much uh, health is going to be a concern. I mean, if they can stay healthy, they're a playoff team without question. If Coach Cousins can play with more consistency like he did a couple of years ago uh, when the Vikings got to the second round of the playoffs, they're, 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 gonna, they're, they're 9, 10, maybe 11 wins um, because their defense are good enough to win games for them. And they definitely have enough firepower on offense to score, to score points. The rest of the NFC North, the Lions, Jared Goff is a good quarterback. He just doesn't have anyone to throw the ball to in Detroit anymore. With Gall- with Galladay now in uh, in East Rutherford, and uh, Chicago is basically just um, the countdown to Justin Fields taking over full time. Uh, but hey, look, I agree with with Andy Dalton starting right away because you can't feed Justin Fields to the likes of Aaron Donald week one by the gate. Don't you don't want to break the young kid's confidence and have Aaron Donald pretty much wearing him as a secondary jersey right, uh, to start his NFL career. But look, uh, the Vikings, um, I, I, I see the, the high ceiling being 10 wins, wild card team. Uh, once come the world's injuries hit them again, particularly on the defensive side. Kirk Cousins struggles yet again and have another offseason of questioning why the Vikings are sticking with him for so long. And hopefully for Kirk Cousins, he is not the reason why the Vikings forfeit a game because of COVID. Uh, knocking on wood here. I hope yeah. nothing. I hope that doesn't happen to any of the teams this year. But the Vikings are a team that should um, push for the playoffs. Also, Devin Thomas is a, 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 a name Great giant fans are familiar with. To be able to help them with yeah. that, uh, the stop the run. You forgot and, uh, one. And obviously, they they absolutely need to stop the run after Alvin Kamala scored six rushing touchdowns and, on Anthony. Uh, you Day. forgot. So, Anthony, you forgot the one game that will make Jet fans annoy because they just got Chris Herndon via trade after Herb Smith Jr. got injured. And knowing Jet fans love, I'm expecting at least 10 touchdowns this year. And, <laughs> yeah, and because, he has to, because he has somebody to throw the ball to him this time around. I mean, he had doesn't anybody. matter. He never caught a ball, but he was with the Jets anyway, no matter who threw the ball to him. It's not like Sam Darnold was chopped liver. <laughs> Although Joe may think differently. All right. <laughs> Only with the Jets. Only with the Jets. Only with the Jets. <laughs> Only with the Jets. Everything changes immediately when you get to Carolina. Uh, so, Anthony, there was a show back in our days, in the young days, on Saturday morning called California Dreams, if you don't remember that show. Off sure. yet. And I just say that because Jay's not going to get this reference because – don't wake Matthew Stafford up in the NFC West because he's leaving <laughs> Detroit and he's now California dreaming in Los Angeles. That makes them very intriguing, Jay. Yeah, and Rabbi, I watched that show, so shut up. All right. Bye. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, look, this, this may be the toughest division in the NFL. I mean, aside from the Cardinals, the other three teams are legitimate playoff contenders. Uh, Kyler Murray is a good fit for this offense, and maybe the change of scenery and scheme will return A.J. Green to his Cincinnati heyday. Uh, Playing alongside DeAndre Hopkins should give him some more single coverage opportunities. The health of running back James Conner and former All-Pro defensive end J.J. Watt could go a long way to the cards making some noise. Look, the Seahawks. 
They have Russell Wilson, DK Metcalf, and Tyler Lockett to make big plays in the passing game. Chris Carson returns to lead the running game. Yeah, Russ wants to be left alone to cook. Yeah, head coach Pete Carroll wants to run more. New offensive coordinator Shane Waldron, who came over from the Rams, will have to find a way to marry the two differing philosophies. This defense isn't going to remind anyone of the Legion of Boom, but with the Hawks having, on paper, the easiest schedule in the NFL, it may not need to. The 49ers are banking on the return to health and form of two of their key players, one on each side of the ball. Jimmy Garoppolo, who is expected to be the starting quarterback, and defensive end Nick Bosa. Uh, they, San Francisco needs them once again to have, uh, you know, to be in their prime, to have them to be in the postseason conversation. With Garoppolo, they've report, re- performed like the NFL's fourth best offense, according to True Media's expected points added per play metric. Without Garoppolo, they've performed like the 27th ranked offense. Their defensive scheme is predicated on the front four providing pressure on the quarterback. So the return of an elite talent like Bosa from a torn ACL will be huge. But the Rams are the team that I think has the best chance to be the class of the division. And it's based on change at one position, which happens to be the most important position, quarterback. As we've already discussed, out is Jared Goff. In comes Matthew Stafford. And if you listen to head coach Sean McVay, it'll make all the difference in the world. Yes, the Rams still have three-time Defensive Player of the Year, Aaron Donald, the most disruptive D-lineman in the game since entering the NFL in 2014. He has 152 more quarterback pressures than any other lineman. Yeah, they also still have Jalen Ramsey, who may be arguably the best cornerback in the game. And this season, the Rams are going to try and figure out how many different ways they can put him in position to affect and influence the outcome of games. Yeah, WizKid Defensive Coordinator Brandon Staley left to become head coach of the Chargers. So he just basically moved down the hall, um, basically. But his replacement, Raheem Morris, is keeping most of Staley's coverage dictates front, stop the pass first, two high shell post-snap rotation scheme, which became the most dominant defense in the league over the course of the season, ranking number one in total defense, number one against explosive passing plays, passing yards, and yards allowed per pass attempt and touchdowns, and number three against the run. Morris and McVeigh agreed when he took the Rams job that he wasn't going to change much uh, of what was already working, even though that meant learning a coaching system that wasn't his. If he can do that and call it as effectively as Staley did, nothing on that side of the ball will change too much. It's the offense, McVeigh's side of the ball, where the change is abounding. The big negative is the loss of dynamic running back Cam Akers to an Achilles injury, which landed him on IR and will have him out for the year. That said, Daryl Henderson more than capably filled in for Akers last season, averaging four and a half yards per carry on the ground and almost 10 yards per reception to the year before he landed on injured reserve for the regular season finale in both playoff games. He's back, he's healthy, and is expected to pick up where he left off as the Rams' number one running back. Cooper Cup and Robert Woods return as the starting wide receivers. And the addition of Deshaun Jackson gives McVay a guy who can still take the top off of defense when he's healthy. He's only played eight games over the last two seasons, so when he's healthy is very much a problem. problem. That's kind of a problem. But when he was on the field, he averaged 17.2 yards per catch. But what it will all come down to is the new guy under center. With a confident veteran quarterback running the show now in Stafford, a quarterback who, unlike his predecessor, doesn't let turnovers affect his next play, who can get the ball downfield and create the explosive plays consistently, whether it's by the way he can avoid pressure and reset his launch point in order to help a play continue developing downfield or through play action, Stafford recorded 60.5% completion on play action passes in 2020 with an average of 8.6 yards per attempt, including 11.1 air yards per throw with 58% of the yards he picked up coming through the air and not after catch. And those are diametrically opposite to what they were forced to do to accommodate the issues they had with Goff last year. Um, <coughs> excuse me. The Rams, as we know, consistently rank among the top five offenses in the NFL in their frequency use of play action. So with that alone, Stafford is a great fit. McVay is salivating at the prospect of being able to once again use his entire playbook and once again <laughs> having one of the most dangerous offenses in the NFL. <laughs> the Rams are going to be a, a, a team to watch this year, guys. Me and, and, they, and they will have, and they will actually have Rams fans in the building. 
<laughs> me and Joe have always talked about the fact that how horrible of a quarterback Jared Goff was, and I think we've seen that. I think we've seen, we're going to see that... the results this year because Jared Goff had such. You almost had to make the playbook elementary. Yeah, the and and I think McVay was willing. What McVay said. I mean, you remember. I mean, we yeah. talked about last year about the way the the Steelers kind of had to re, you know resort to this whole sh- throw short run long scenario in order to get their passing game working it was pretty much what McVay had they to were... do off last year and it drove him absolutely nuts i have never seen a quarterback or at least in recent memory who regressed from up here to all the way down here in what amounted to a blink of an eye in Jared Goff hey look i, I think about the super bowl think about this i mean we did about the Super Bowl against New England. New England had a vulnerable secondary, but a quarterback who just couldn't take advantage of it. Yep. And it showed. Yeah. He just went backwards ever since. Yep. Yeah, this is going to be – I'm very interested to see what the Rams do this year. God, that division is just so stacked. I feel so bad for Arizona because you can't build a team when you play those three teams <laughs> twice in a year. When you have yep. 617 games against Giants like those – and, and the Cardinals could have made the playoffs last year on top of it. They could have easily made the playoffs if it wasn't for John Wofford and the Los Angeles Rams. Now, hey, what happens with Joe, the if we move the Cardinals back, if we move the Cardinals back to the East where they were when they were in St. Louis, <laughs> yeah. do, do they win the division if we do that? <laughs> they were still in, they were still in Arizona in the East, which was the worst three of them. But that's not in the inside. Okay, <laughs> so moving on to the NFC South, it's interesting. Let's just t- let's just take the let's just take the um, spoiler alert. Tampa Bay is going to be really good. You rarely see a Super Bowl team get every player back offensively, yeah. defensively. That doesn't even include a full season of Antonio Brown. So, I think the obvious answer here is Tampa Bay is probably going to be at least an eleven win team like they were last year, and that's being nice. They're going to be a twelve or thirteen win team. We'll talk about them in a second when we get into our playoff preview. I think Tampa is a lock to win this division. I don't think there's any question about that. Carolina, Sam Darnold, new era. Could be interesting to see if Sam has learned from his time in New York after going out of the end of Gay's prison and being moved to at least a more solid foundation for Matt Wolf. He passed his prologue, he will. He passed the prologue, he will, but I think the question is, can he show improvement? Because there's always a, there's always a new person out there, and Carolina needs somebody now to take the good best years of Christian McCaffrey and use them really well. Good organization. Well, I mean, Rabbi, he, 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 he reunites with his new be- with his you know his old best friend Robbie Anderson. So that that's a good. We'll see what happens. Robbie it's a very it's a very good it's a very good receiving force along with DJ Moore. Atlanta is always interesting because they can either <clears throat> score forty points in a game and lose have a 20 point lead going into the fourth quarter and lose, they basically can lose every single conceivable way. And I don't think that's going to change until they change Matt Ryan as quarterback. Oh, but I don't Ryan know. is still the best choice. Hey, I don't Matt know. I, what? We'll you, see. You don't, we'll you don't see. think Arthur Jay? Smith resurrect Ryan the way he resurrected Tannehill? I don't he know. Doesn't have to have, he doesn't have to resurrect Ryan. The problem is Ryan is still good. The question is Ryan might be regressing now. Okay. <laughs> Moving on, though, to the team I'm really interested in. That's a team that's had enough talent in the last few years. And people have said Drew Brees, now retired and going to spread all of his nice agendas onto Sunday Night Football and Notre Dame Football on NBC. The Saints could be very, very intriguing in many different ways. And one of the best run organizations in the league, Sean Payton has always made sure that there are always weapons around this team. But the reason why those weapons always fit is because they had a Hall of Fame quarterback under center. And we are always asking this with teams like what happens when Peyton Manning leaves the Broncos. Spoiler alert, they suck. What happens the year Tom Brady leaves the Patriots? Spoiler alert, they suck. But I don't think the Saints ever really had a succession plan. I think a lot of Saints fans wanted Taysom Hill to improve his craft at quarterback and make sure he becomes the next dual threat who can score 30 touchdowns in a season. That didn't happen. So they actually have a quarterback who can throw the ball at Jameis Winston. But Jameis Winston is the most hot and cold quarterback probably in the history of the NFL in his 30-for-30 season as he had two (laughs) years ago at Tampa Bay in 2019. 
Janus has a lot of weapons, although one of those weapons will be Michael Thomas. He's out for at least six weeks. Where have you been, buddy? <laughs> you have Marquez Callaway now. You have Alden Kamara, who is probably the best weapon in the NFL when you combine his run and pass catching skills. Probably in a little better of an era, uh, a little better of a Christian McCaffrey role, but he knows he always finds his way into the end zone. You have a very, very interesting team. They're also not going to be able to play in their own state for at least a month. That's going to hurt them so bad because of the effects of Hurricane Ida. They're playing in freaking Jacksonville. Hey, on they've Sunday. done it once before. They've done it once before, and that was the year where Brees started as a quarterback. They're not going to be displaced all season. And I'm very interested to see what the Saints do this year. This team could be. 6-11 and 11 and getting ready for a whole new incarnation of this team where this team can do what happened when Teddy Bridgewater took over for Drew Brees two years ago and they were humming a beautiful tune. They could be a 12-5 and five team challenging Tampa Bay and still being the NFC contender that they've always been. I don't know and that's what makes it interesting. Hey, Rabbi, and, uh, I tell you, if, if, if Jameis throws – less than one interception per game uh they have a shot because they do because he has all a about arm. him not shooting them in the foot uh, i mean if he goes 30 and 30 they're doomed if he goes 30 and 15 they're going to be dangerous in that division but, and i i think the point with them also is you know, I, I don't know how much of that offense he's going to be able to grasp because we all know what John Payton's like. The fact that Taysom Hill gave him such a run is because he knows that offense and he can run most of it. And I think that'll be interesting to see what happens with Jameis. Does, does he start out by throwing those four or five interceptions and you go, hey, guess what? We're going to run the ball <laughs> and we're going to let this guy throw it 10 I'm times. Right. We're going to Tim Tebow this game. We're going to let him throw it 10 times and we're going to run it the rest of the time. And you do have know. Alan Kamara and you got all those other guys. So, and, and I don't think I agree with you, Jay, it happened with Katrina, but I don't think when they come back to the Superdome, because it's, because that wasn't the, the center of the storm and all that yeah. stuff. I don't think you're going to get that crazy. We're coming back, you know, that un, that unwinnable night for whoever the other team was that night that they went down there. I said that Atlanta because yeah, of course I, every unwinnable game is Atlanta. No, I mean, so it's it's not a joke, but I mean, look, with fans in the stands and stadiums at full capacity, home field advantage is actually yeah. going yeah. to be mean something. So, yeah. I mean, it may not have the same effect as it did because of the devastation that Katrina wrought and the saints were so heavily, uh, you know, a part of the resurrection of new Orleans. So it's not going to be the same on that level, but if you don't think the silver, if you don't think, oh, no, I, I already said loud as hell when they finally can play, it, we, play yeah. them, we play them week four. And I yes. already said to everybody, I don't, as long as we're not the first game back in New Orleans. Right. Not, you don't want to be yeah. the first one. I'll go anywhere you want me to go. <laughs> I don't want to be, be tough, It'll be right October. That's in the you. wheelhouse. Hey, look, if you don't think the Saints and the Superdome home field advantage uh, doesn't matter, just Google Steve Gleason, and that should oh, tell no, you I, everything I, you need to know. Me, I, don't need, I don't need to Google it. I watched it and I called it before it happened. There's <laughs> no <laughs> way anybody would win in that game except the New Orleans. The most, right. the most funny thing about this whole thing is the process that has happened. To get that the Saints chose Jacksonville yep. as their site for week one, knowing that A, Aaron Rodgers is a, not a great quarterback in the state of Florida, and B, knowing that that's the best way that they can keep most of their tickets for this game because they know they're going to lose tickets because the Packer fan base is the Packer fan base, but the Packers are trying to buy the tickets up anyway. It's a very nice little cat and mouse game that I don't think the Saints really wanted to play in no. week one of the season. But again, as we said, week one is the new week three of the preseason, which is why everything is so interesting yeah. going into a freaking 17-game season. Speaking of, it's the biggest season ever. Thank you, NFL tagline. Uh, again, this is a season that won't end until February 13th, 2022. We have 21 weeks of consecutive Sunday football. 22 weeks, I'm sorry, of consecutive Sunday football starting next Sunday. <clears throat> so 
it's time for Joe's favorite part of the show, predicting <laughs> who's going to make the Super Bowl. Joe, give us a little spiel of why you either make a prediction or just give us a spiel of why you don't like predictions. I don't care, but it's always <laughs> funny to ask you first, who is going to make the Super Bowl? Yeah, so there, obviously I, the reason I hate this segment is it's a, you know, we haven't it's seen anybody. Right. So we don't know who's going to get her. This is like when they put out the strength of schedule yes. before the draft and before free agency. You don't even know who's playing quarterback, but it's going to be a tough game because it's just going to be a tough game. I'm going to pick, I'll pick, I'll pick the matchup instead of who's going to win. No, that's we don't, the, we don't want you to pick it. We, we, we just we, want we the want matchup. The matchup. Yeah. Yeah. The, matchup. the matchup will be Anthony's Aaron Rodgers led Green Bay Packers <laughs> versus I guess I got I guess I have to go I, I don't want to go Kansas City because I'll tell you I'm more worried about their offensive line than I am about the Giants because they got five new guys and that's not going to be an easy task I think even though their offense has been good but they've been healthy for a long time so I don't really want to pick Kansas City. That may sound strange. Hmm. So I'm going to put Buffalo okay. in there. I'm going to put okay. Buffalo and Green Bay. Two okay. cold weather teams going wow. to LA, going, going indoors to LA to play the Super Bowl. <laughs> uh, two fan bases that will make that place go. That, that'll crazy. make the play. <laughs> by, by the way, two notes about that that are very interesting. The stadium is extremely hot. They haven't quite I figured out that. the whole air conditioning thing because it's built into the ground um, because of earthquakes and all that stuff. They had to actually build it into the yeah. ground and because the planes go over and that, and if the chain crew, which you know, I'm intimately involved with for the mm -hmm. Rams, if the Rams make the Super Bowl, then the chain gang can't work the game. <laughs> so they're all rooting for them to get to the NFC championship game and lose. So they can work the the chain gang on the Super Bowl. So it's a little little bit of a weird interesting. Um, I guess that means Tampa Bay. That means Tampa yeah, so last game. last year the Tampa chain crew wasn't allowed to work the game. Wow, interesting. So, all right. Uh Anthony. Anyway. You know what? And here's the thing. Next week, we're going to protect who hosts the uh, Nickelodeon wildcard game because that's what I'm looking forward to this season more than anything, okay? I want to see someone get slimed for a touchdown. But, Joe, we're thinking the same thing because I had Green Bay come out of the NFC. And for the Buffalo Bills, they did everything last year except figure out the Kansas City Chiefs offense in two matchups. This year, I can literally picture them going into Arrowhead for the AFC Championship game and actually beating Patrick, Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs because that offensive line, we don't know what's going on and if they're going to be good enough to at least give Patrick Mahomes enough time when he's not running for dear life like he was in the Super Bowl just uh, last February. So my matchup is the Bills and the Packers, and I feel like it'd be a great matchup too because we, we're going to have two other better improv quarterbacks starting in, that, in this game. You got Aaron Rodgers and you have Josh Allen, who is notable for, for being able to improvise out of the, out of the pocket and, and give you one or two huddles, huddles over a defender a game. So it would be it would be really interesting to see, yeah, two very cold weather teams and two passionate fan base too. You have Packer fans who travel like- He's heads from Bills Miami Mafia. Home. Yep. Yeah, and you had the Bills, the ever-loving Bills Mafia, who put each, put each other through tables. <laughs> and by the way, they don't even heckle their opponents. They donate to charities. So that so <laughs> they, they have the, the best of both worlds, just as far as uh, two fan base who so, are just very famous for very different reasons. So the takeaway from that is go to Vegas and root against and vote – and bet against both those teams if Anthony and I picked them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, Pittsburgh and who, Jay? Pittsburgh no, and who? No. Oh, <laughs> he never picked Pittsburgh. Pick he never picked Pittsburgh. No. I, I got to tell you, the one year I picked the Steelers, it was the year they beat the Seahawks. 
And Nisa and I both picked them that same year. And both of us regret not going anywhere to lay down a hundred bucks. <laughs> in, the, um, in the worst officiated game in the history of the NFL that caused replay. And to you happen. would know. <laughs> okay. AFC for me, it's Kansas city. And look, it's really this simple. As long as the chiefs have Andy Reid calling the plays and Patrick Mahomes executing them, the playmakers like running back Clyde Edwards, Alaire, Wide receiver Tyree Kill and tight end Travis Kelsey, it's pretty damn hard to bet against them. Yeah, they revamped their offensive line. They have five new starters. Veteran left tackle Orlando Brown Jr. and veteran left guard Joe Thune are the big additions, protecting Mahomes' blind side. And while these guys not maybe a huge upgrade of what they had last year, the Chiefs do have more depth on the O-line than last year, so they're better able to survive the injuries that cost them last year. Add to that a defense led by defensive tackle Chris Jones, defensive end Frank Clark, who the Chiefs hope will be ready week one. He's been out most of the preseason. And strong safety, Teron Matthew, the honey badger. These guys play coordinator Steve Spagnuolo's scheme well enough. <clears throat> so, yeah, I'm taking the Chiefs to come out of the AFC. For the NFC, I'm going with the Rams for all the reasons I stated in the previous segment. I know Tampa Bay is returning all of their starters, and they should own the NFC South. And it is hard to bet against the Green Bay Packers with Aaron Rodgers. But even with a schedule that has them hosting the Bucs and going to Lambeau, as well as having to play two games each against the Niners, the Seahawks, and the Cardinals, I like the Rams coming out of the NFC. And it's all because Sean McVay finally has a legit quarterback to execute his offense. I have the same thing Jay does. I Get actually out of have the same thing Jay does. I think no way. I think, so we have two of the same things. Yeah. So <laughs> uh, to Anthony and Joe's point about about Buffalo, I'm stunned here. Team. Rabbi, I'm how long have you and I have been doing the show together? I don't think I we've ever had the same pick. I agree. So and so let's talk about. I think that the Chiefs are the best team in the AFC, and it's not even a question. No one was on their league last year. Buffalo played them twice. Kansas City ran the ball like crazy against them the first time. Kansas City threw the ball like crazy against them the second time. Buffalo was a very, very good team. But unfortunately, Kansas City has the kryptonite to almost everything any team can bring defensively. They are the most, if Patrick Mahomes is healthy and got the pin, any team can be healthy in any way, shape, or form. They're unbeatable. They haven't lost too many games with Patrick Mahomes under center. It is almost one of the biggest guarantees in sports. And this isn't like a Tom Brady situation when he will be great in postseason. Mahomes just doesn't lose. So you're thinking even if he goes 13 and three this year and they have home field advantage. 13 and four. I forgot. I hate the seven. <laughs> 14. You and me both. They're going to it, Kansas City is. I just think if I, I think the reason I discounted him also was I just think it's tough to get there three years in a row I do think it's tough to get there three years in a row something can happen you know something can happen along the way and I'm not wishing you know bad on anybody it it doesn't it doesn't bad bounces and strange things happen and but just remember it's a long if this happened if they get there three years in a row they'll follow the Patriots who got there three years in a row from 51 to 53 so yeah. it's not like it's impossible. No, 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 no. That's why I'm thinking this is. That's why I'm thinking the Chiefs are going to win again. And at here's least why they're... I like. Here's why I like the Rams. It is such a cacophony of teams in the NFC that can that can make the Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. I never believed in Green Bay because I think there's just way too much against this team in the postseason. And with Aaron Rodgers carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders, guess what? That world usually collapses on him in the postseason. He's one in four in NFC championship games for a reason, guys. And that's kind of one of the reasons why I don't trust him. I'm happy about that. And look, if you're engaged with Shalene Woodley, that's the heck of a world to collapse on you. It is a world to collapse, what I'm saying, but I'm saying his his playoff world is not a great world. No, you're right. I think the I think the Bucs are too obvious, and I think people don't realize that team had a lot of flaws going into the postseason last year. So they had a very good run, but they had a lot of matchups go their way. I'm not saying they're not a 12 or 13 win team, 12 and 5 or 13 and 4, but I do think come postseason, there are teams that can match up with Tampa Bay. One of those was the Rams, but I'll get to them in a second. I picked Seattle last year, got bit in the ass, and I think Russell Wilson's not the same quarterback. He, December than he is in September. And there's just not a lot of that team defensively. 
Right. San Fran was a very close team I was going to pick here, but I don't like the fact that Trey Lance is going to be a specter on this team the entire season. And the and the, even if Garoppolo plays to his biggest potential, which he can't, he's still a pretty damn good quarterback, by the way. Top 10 to 15 when he's healthy. Yeah. <clears throat> there's going to be like, where's Trey Lance going to be in this package? So I like San Francisco. I think San Francisco may end up being in the NFC Championship game with the Los Angeles Rams. But the Rams last year with Jared Goff made the freaking final eight. This team is defensively stacked at all positions. And I don't care about Deshaun Jackson, but I think that offense has always been just a solid offense. And I think even getting little pieces in the puzzle, like getting Sony Michelle to yeah, go in that game. backfield to replace whatever Daryl Henderson would have been a Cam Akers. I think this is going to be a team that I think Stafford has the right moves and I think this team is built to win now so yes I knew we were going to pick the same teams but show and Anthony are going Green Bay Buffalo Nick and Jay are going Kansas you know what? City LA Super Bowl too. this is interesting yeah and get back to your pick wouldn't it suck for the Kansas City Chiefs to have to play another uh, play a team in a Super Bowl and they'll back you off in a second year in a row yep, yep. I don't think it really helped Tampa Bay last year. And I think because it was only a 25,000 seat stadium, it was that offensive line that right. killed Kansas City last year. But it'll be very interesting to see football is back, gentlemen, in less than 72 hours. Get excited. Let's go. Woo. Thank you, Mr. Joe Tafaro, for joining us Thank as you, always. You Thank can you. see you on the field, at the field as a ref, on the field befriending chain gangs in Los Angeles that may or may not be working Super Bowl 56. <laughs> and you can also see him doing what he does best writing columns for last word on sports. Thank you, Joe. We will see you many times throughout this season. And uh, if I ever need an optimistic view of the Giants, we will definitely get your (laughs) views on everything. For the other three idiots in the room, myself, Jay Kaplan, and Anthony Strait. Again, I'm Stephen Rubinowitz. Thanks for joining us today on the Sports Alliance. Always has social media plenty. We have our on-demand library, youtube.com slash on the sports lines. We are live, like you are seeing right now, at 1237 in the evening at facebook.com slash on the sports lines. Never been more jealous of California as I am tonight. <laughs> nice, nice and beautiful over there at 937. And Jay, what about that Twitter thing? At O-N-T-H Sports Lines is our Twitter handle where links to our shows go along with other interesting sports related tidbits that we think you should read or be made aware of back in the saddle next week on wednesday or thursday but we'll we'll see you then as we have some baseball i promise we have uh, baseball thursday's yom kippur it's got to be wednesday oh wow okay well that's the thing we could do it down and we'd be fine wednesday is so wednesday it is anyway guys Enjoy yourselves. This is a beautiful NFL week. We'll see you back next week on the Sports Lines. Good night, night everybody. Thanks, Thanks, Joe. Good night, everyone.